Hello, let's continue <clears throat> with our third and, third and final video um, about uh, geology in general. So we've talked about plate boundaries, we've talked about weathering and erosion, so now let's talk a little bit about detail of a volcano. Um, a volcano is basically a place where magma reaches the Earth's surface, and then it's called lava, uh, through a crack or a fissure, whatever you want to call it. Um, in addition to the lava that is coming out at a volcano, ash and gases such as water vapor, sulfur dioxide, and carbon dioxide are released um, during volcanic activity. Um, I don't, just a couple of examples. You don't need to know like details here. Um, when Mount Pinatubo erupted in 91, uh, so much ash was released up into the atmosphere that it actually caused what we refer to as a nuclear winter, um, not caused by nuclear war or anything like that, but there was so much ash in the atmosphere that it actually reduced the amount of sunlight um, that was reaching Earth's surface and it cooled Earth's temperature. Now, you might think that 0.5 degrees Celsius is not that much, but it, that's pretty significant when you're talking about a fast change like that. Um, so obviously a lot of ash was released. Uh, Mount St. Helens, just for something that happened in the United States, um, erupted Easter weekend um, in 19, no, was it Easter weekend? Maybe, uh, in the United States, and pictures of Mount St. Helens on the bottom one that is before the eruption, and then the top one is after. So you can see like the whole side of the mountain was just blasted off, um, and you had basically a huge flow of hot ash and hot water rushing down the side. It wasn't lava, uh, but it was something called a pyroclastic flow where it was just super heated water and super hot ash racing down the mountain, um, causing flooding and devastation surrounding in surrounding areas. Um, this is just a picture showing basics of a volcano. Uh, one of my photos from Alaska, whoops, whoops, um, called Mount Redoubt and just kind of off in the distance there. And then this is the one that happened in 2010. I'm not going to try to say its name. It's got like 20 letters. Um, but this was significant because so much ash was released up into the atmosphere that it disrupted air traffic between North America and Europe. It was the biggest reduction in air traffic, or disruption, I should say, in air traffic since World War II. Um, planes could, that's a normal route for planes to fly is by Iceland. Um, as they're going from North America to Europe, and they could not fly through there because of fear of all that ash getting in the engines and causing engine failure. So you're not going to be tested on that, just interesting things, that's all. Um, earthquakes, as I already mentioned, an earthquake is where you have a sudden movement of a plate. Um, the vibrations, otherwise known as seismic waves, radiate outward in all directions um, from that sudden plate movement. The majority of earthquakes happen at convergent and transform boundaries, but because an earthquake is anytime the plates move, earthquakes can happen at all three types of plate boundaries. Um, some general terminology pertaining to earthquakes, focus and epicenter. Um, you always hear about the epicenter of an earthquake, like where, where did it originate from? But the focus and the epicenter are basically the same thing. The focus is the location under the surface, where the plates shifted, and the epicenter is the location above the surface where the plate shifted. So the epicenter is located on the surface directly above the focus. Pretty simple. Um, magnitude, and I'm going to pull up this other one, amplitude. Um, magnitude is in reference to kind of our destruction, um, how much energy was released. Um, the magnitude or the scale we use for Earthquakes is the Richter scale. It's from one to 10. It is a logarithmic scale. So that means it changes. Um, so a two is not just one time worse than a one. Um, and so magnitude is the severity of the earthquake. Amplitude is how big, how tall those seismic waves are that are measured. Um, so the amplitude determines the magnitude, the size of the waves, determines the severity of the earthquake. Um, so you can see here, just again, general ideas about earthquakes. We're not really getting into a lot of detail here. Um, just one really cool thing that happens in some places during an earthquake um, is that the land 
can subside, which means the land can sink down. Um, so this is a picture from Kenai Fjords National Park in Alaska um, at Fox Island in Resurrection Bay. And what you're seeing are a lot of dead trees. You can see there are some that are alive, but in the foreground, you've got a lot of dead trees. And that's what we commonly refer to as a ghost forest or a toothpick forest, because it looks like a lot of little toothpicks sticking up. And there was a big earthquake here in 1964. And the land actually dropped down between six and eight feet. So it sunk or subsided. And what had happened or as a result of that subsidence is that the tree roots sunk down into the ocean water and they started sucking up salt water and the salt water obviously is going to kill off the trees but the salt water also helped to preserve them hence them still standing like that um, and now they're protected you can't actually chop them down or anything like that so during some earthquakes the land can sink or subside which is kind of cool um, this is a different location but still uh, at Kenai Fjords National Park, showing some more of that toothpick forest to those preserved trees that have over the years been, you know, broken apart or by the wind, eroded by the wind. Um, and as a result of the 1964 earthquake, I was like showing this picture of the campground. Um, there was a big tsunami that actually came and hit the town of Seward. And where you see all those RVs right now, that used to be where downtown Seward was um, until it got wiped out by the tsunami. And they decided not to rebuild downtown Seward right there next to the water, and they put it in an RV park instead. Fun facts. Uh, just a little map showing you earthquake risk in the United States, western United States, where you've got the transformed boundary of the San Andreas Fault over here in California. Up here in northwestern Washington State is where you have a convergent plate boundary between the Juan de Fuca plate and the North American plate. Um, and then over here in the eastern United States, these are just areas not near a plate boundary, but where you just have um, uh, plate weaknesses. And so you can get a little bit of earthquake, uh, earthquakes happening there. And then around the world, you can see here. So if you think of where the plate boundaries are, the plate boundaries correspond to where you have the greatest earthquake risk. It's weird how that happens. And the last thing I want to mention, tsunamis um which are formed at a subduction zone where you've got the oceanic crust subducting going down and so when the oceanic crust subducts sometimes it causes the continental crust here on top to push up and what's above that continental crust is the ocean and so as the continental crust raises up the ocean water raises up and then it flows because water is always going to flow, you know, to keep things in equilibrium. Um, so a tsunami can be caused by an underwater earthquake at a subduction zone where the continental crust gets kind of pushed up and the water that's above it rises up as well. And then the water starts flowing and that's what creates a tsunami. You can also have a tsunami being formed from like meteor impact and landslides and things like that. Uh, the Indian Ocean tsunami of 2004 happened at the Java Trench, really big earthquake, huge amount of displacement of the seafloor. You don't need to know these numbers, but really big waves, uh, massive destruction, unfortunately. But what had happened, what was really interesting is that we saw how important coral reefs and mangroves were in protecting the land. Um, so some places, <clears throat> had removed their mangrove forests to make way for shrimp farming and things like that. Other countries had kept their mangroves intact. And so having mangroves and intact coral reefs, those, those habitats or ecosystems act as a buffer and help slow the wave down, slow down uh, the velocity of those tsunami waves. And so anywhere where you had intact mangroves and intact coral reefs, you actually had less damage than places where the mangroves had been cleared away. This little video kind of shows that buffering ability. So you can see the waves hitting the trees. And then beyond that, there's barely any wave movement on shore. And so this just kind of goes to show that keeping mangrove ecosystems intact 
mangroves do provide a service to not only us, but to land in general. The mangroves help to act as a buffer and absorb the impact of the waves to help prevent erosion here on the shoreline. Um, you can read through this yourself. Yeah, so that's that for geology. We don't have to do the rock cycle. Um, it's no longer being covered on the AP test. If you want to know about rocks, though, you can ask me and I can, I can tell you all about the rock cycle. So that's a quick overview of geology. Please let me know if anything confused you. And that's all. Bye-bye.